thank you very much, Tom, for agreeing. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for agreeing to give a go this whole seminar. And you can get started. Thank you, Kate. So I will try to share the screen. And I assume you see both the right screen and my laser pointer. Yes. So um, again, if I need to introduce myself, which is always somewhat embarrassing, I'm a, I'm a chemist by education. I grew up in Switzerland, but of American origin. And I've lived in Switzerland for most of my life. And I, I, I grew up speaking both French and English. And um, so I was educated as a chemist and quite early when I initiated my independent career, I, I started thinking about, you know, how do chemists do things and how do biology or how does biology do things? And arguably this is rather different and this is what kind of inspired my uh, my approach to catalysis. So um, again, this is where it starts. So I, I come from a background of a homogeneous, I, I can hear some beep. Is that me or who is it? I don't hear anything, so it must be okay. on your side. Yeah, yeah. All right, sorry. Sorry. So um, again, a, a small molecule catalysis typically consists of a metal, and we like to use precious metals or so rhodium, palladium, iridium, that is bound to a ligand one on the left side. And this small molecule catalyst will bind to its substrate and then undergo a reaction. So what distinguishes these small molecule catalysts from enzymes is the fact on the one hand that very often in a small molecule catalyst, the substrate actually binds to the metal. And in the enzymes, it often happens that the substrate, and this is a cytochrome P450 with the camphor substrate highlighted in yellow bound, the substrate does not actually bind to the metal, in this case, an iron heme. And what chemists do to optimize catalytic performance is that they optimize the ligand, which is symbolized here with this essentially white and colorful ligands. So it's a lot of organic synthesis to optimize the structure of the ligand that will ultimately influence the outcome of the catalytic events. And so what people typically do in this context here is that they think that they need to build bulkiness and chirality immediately adjacent to the metal, whereas for an enzyme, if you look at the ligand, this heme porphyrin type ligand is completely achiral and the chirality actually comes from what I call the second coordination sphere, which are the amino acid residues that are more distant from where the substrate binds. Okay, and using this type of analogy, what, what I like to think is that chemistry has the advantage of being able to access many different metals that have really very different reactivities that cannot be found in enzymes, but we're limited by the fact that the ligands are quite difficult to synthesize. So the idea that came to me about 20 years ago was, why don't we combine the best of both worlds, namely we would select a catalytically competent organometallic moiety, which displays a reactivity that is not found in nature, so new to nature catalysis. And we would embed this catalytically active organometallic moiety within an evolvable protein scaffold, which would allow us to use genetic optimization strategies to optimize the performance of the artificial metalloenzyme. And this, you know, reminded me of Gerald Joyce claim, who says, biology is nothing more than chemistry with a memory. And I came to realize that what we're trying to do is we're turning the problem around. That is, we're endowing organometallic catalysis with a genetic memory, which allows you to evolve and even select for improved catalytic performance. So the first question that we had to address in this context was, we want to know where the cofactor is located and therefore 
what kind of strategy can we use to ensure the localization of the cofactor? And as a chemist, and again, I need to apologize, I have a 100% chemistry background. You would typically start with a covalent anchoring strategy. So you would take a nucleophilic amino acid, typically cysteine, and you would react it with an electrophilic group on your organometallic moiety. And again, this organometallic moiety shown here would need to be water tolerant. But apart from that, it could catalyze any reaction that for which nature has no equivalent. So again, this is a covalent anchoring. The next possibility would be to take your, what we call cofactor and use an amino acid side chain to coordinate to the cofactor and ultimately activate this cofactor. So the free cofactor would be totally inactive, but upon coordination to this histidine, for example, you would activate the cofactor. And this is reminiscent of a P450 that has a cysteine or a myoglobin that has a histidine bound, et cetera, et cetera. A third possibility would be to use a non-covalent inhibitor for a protein of choice. And this non-covalent inhibitor would be connected to your organometallic catalyst. And this is what we like to call supramolecular anchoring. And finally, a few years ago, John Hartwig from Berkeley came up with a very elegant strategy whereby he would essentially take a metalloprotein and substitute the native metal, so typically iron, for a metal that has unusual reactivities. And unfortunately, chemists have grown addicted to very expensive metals. So most of what used to be done until five years ago in catalysis was based on precious metal catalysts. So again, palladium is one of the favorite metals, but rhodium and ruthenium are also quite popular. So these are the four strategies to ensure the localization of your metal cofactor within a protein scaffold. And you know, most of what we have done in the past was based on supramolecular anchoring. And somehow when, when a student joins the group and I tell him or her, oh, by the way, you will not work on supramolecular anchoring, they feel that it's like a punishment. Why can't I work with the biotin streptamine technology? But again, I would like to convince you that there are other strategies that are equally effective, and I will touch upon a few of them during the talk. But so let me start with the, the biotin streptavin technology. So as most of you are biologists, I guess you know that biotin displays a very high affinity for either avidin or streptavidin, and the idea would be to essentially use biotin as an anchor and target streptavidin to anchor your organometallic catalyst shown here within a protein and to combine chemical optimization so we could introduce a spacer between the biotin anchor and the organometallic moiety and you can vary the nature of the spacer and you can also introduce diversity on the gene of either avidin or streptavidin and by combining chemical and genetic diversity, you can screen for basically any reaction that is compatible with water if your organometallic catalyst has some kind of activity for this transformation. And then you could essentially introduce mutations, vary the nature of the spacer or the nature of the ligands, and to obtain an optimized artificial metalloenzyme for a given transformation. So this has been the overall strategy using the biotin streptavidin technology. And this is essentially a summary of 16 years of work. So you know we started with hydrogenation. We moved to transfer hydrogenation, all kinds of reactions. And essentially, my business model has been, if nature can, can do a reaction, let's not look at it. Because beating nature is going to be challenging. So what we have tried to do is to bring new to nature reactions within a cellular environment. And one of the most interesting reactions, in my opinion, is olefin metathesis. And I'll show you in a minute what I mean with this, because it's a completely bio-orthogonal reaction. That is, if you bring a substrate for olefin metathesis within a cell, it will, with a very high probability, remain completely untouched by natural enzymes. And here's an X-ray structure of an artificial metalloenzyme consisting of a cofactor shown here 
which is a piano stool complex, no need to worry what it is. But you can see down here, this is the biotin binding site. So there's a biotin binding site, there's a spacer right here, and there's a cofactor. And this would be, so to speak, the active site with close-lying amino acid residues that can be subjected to directed evolution. And as you will see in a couple of the slides is that there are two privileged positions, which is this position right here, which is position 112, which is the wild type is a serine. In this case, it's an alanine. And position 121, which in the wild type is a lysine, as you can see here. And I should say that the protein streptavidin is a dimer of dimer. So there's one biotin binding site here. There's an adjacent biotin binding site right here. And then on the other side of this, whatever, you know, C2 symmetric protein, there are two additional biotin binding sites. And again, so I will devote my entire talk to olefin metathesis. And the first strategy I would like to outline, because it, it may seem like the easiest to pursue, is to use a covalent anchoring strategy. And to do this, we selected halo tag, which is a protein which has an active aspartic acid at position 106, and it will react with alkyl halide. So typically a bromide would be very good or even a chloride. And if you now anchor a ruthenium metathesis catalyst shown either here or here to a long chain alkyl, typically eight carbons between your catalyst and the halide, the halide will react with the aspartic acid to form an ester, ensuring the localization of your ruthenium catalyst inside of this protein, this genetically encoded host protein. And then you can do olefin metathesis, and olefin metathesis takes two alkenes and connects them together, creating, for example, a cyclic alkene and releasing one equivalent of ethylene, C2H4. And again, we looked at this covalent anchoring strategy primarily because we had not done much with the covalent anchoring. And our third attempt with covalent anchoring has led us to conclude that although chemically quite intuitive, it may not be the best to assemble artificial metalloenzyme. And I, I would prefer to focus on the other anchoring strategies. So you know, having shown that 13 reactions can indeed be implemented with the help of artificial metalloenzymes, I moved to Basel about 13 years ago, and I set out to essentially bring these new to nature reactions within a cellular environment. And being a chemist, for me, E. coli is challenging enough, so I've stuck mostly to E. coli. We've done some, some Pichia pastoris, and we're doing mammalian cells now, but most of the work is done in, in E. coli. And so what, what I did when I moved to Basel was to think, you know, what are the challenges that prevent systematic implementation of new to nature reactions catalyzed by artificial metalloenzymes within a cellular environment? And the first one is the metals that we use are very thiophilic, which means you have a challenge because very often the cofactor is not compatible with the cellular components. And the biggest issue is glutathione, which in the case of aerobically grown E. coli corresponds to millimolar concentrations. So again, this was one issue that we set out to address. Another one is that we would like to have a cofactor which is catalytically inactive and is activated only upon incorporation inside of the protein. And this is what we like to call protein accelerated catalysis. Finally, you know, we, we've done some ICPMS, and I'll show you some data. Is realistically, you can hope to concentrate your cofactor to roughly say five micromolar inside of the cell. And as organometallic chemists, you like to work in concentrated solutions. So performing catalysis at such low catalyst concentration is actually quite challenging. Most of what we've done is, I would say, medium throughput, so typically 96 well-played assays. We would like to go to selection because I think this would be a very nice illustration of the power of artificial metalloenzymes. And ultimately, we would like to complement metabolic pathways. That is, you have 
a series of four or five enzymes with one of them being an artificial metalloenzyme. And I'll show you examples for all of these uh, aspects. So again, as I mentioned, if you take a gram-negative bacterium such as E. coli, if you grow it aerobically, you have actually quite high concentrations of glutathione, which in the presence of your typical palladium or ruthenium is a problem because glutathione will evolve or any, any thiol will bind to the metal completely inhibited. So what we came to realize that in gram-negative bacteria, in the periplasm, so first of all, the glutathione concentration is significantly lower. And most importantly, it's an oxidizing environment, which means that most of the thiols exist as their disulfides. And these are much less efficient at inhibiting catalysis. So we have tried to essentially secrete the protein of interest into the periplasm and assemble the artificial metalloenzyme in the periplasm. An alternative strategy that we looked at was to essentially display the protein of interest on the surface of E. coli and then perform catalysis on the surface of E. coli. Most importantly, you want to maintain the phenotype genotype linkage. And if you have a cell that is active, you can sequence which mutant of your protein of interest is leading to this increased activity. So again, if you look at the pros and cons, surface display, the expression levels are quite low but has the advantage that the glutathione concentration is very low and both cofactor and substrate can easily access the outer membrane of E. coli. The periplasm, the expression levels are actually quite reasonable. The glutathione concentration is quite low and the outer membrane is quite permeable, suggesting that this could be a good place to perform catalysis. And then the cytoplasm, which you know, we would like to be able to achieve catalysis there, Expression levels are very high, glutathione concentration is very high, and the inner membrane is significantly less permeable than the outer membrane, which means bringing in your cofactor and your substrates might be a challenge. So I will focus on the periplasm and the surface display and show you an artificial cell or a protocell that would is meant to mimic the cytoplasm, but without the glutathione. So again, I should spend a few minutes on what is the biotin streptavidin technology. I'm sure many of you know the technology. It's called molecular Velcro among the molecular biology community. And it's based on the fact that this biotin avidin or streptavidin binding has a very high affinity, even if you derivatize this valeric acid side chain. Streptavidin is a homo as well as avidin or homo tetrameric proteins with four completely independent binding events. Each binding event with a biotinolid has an affinity typically higher than 10 to the 10. So as chemists, we talk about association constants. You like dissociation constants. And this biotin streptavidin technology has found multiple applications ever since the first reports by Bayer and Wilczek in the 1960s. So if you think about the principle, you would again add your biotinylated organometallic catalyst. It would ensure its localization in the protein. It's basically irreversible. And based on the X-ray structure, you know that the cofactor is indeed inside of the protein environment. So again, realizing that the periplasm might be a good place to perform catalysis, we set out to express streptavidin in the cytoplasm and then secrete it into the periplasm and have it assemble as the homo tetrameric protein. You can see here a, a gel, actually a denaturing gel. And this band here of the periplasmic extract is actually homo tetrameric streptavidin, which is beautifully homo tetrameric and it's, it's fully functional. This is an electron microscopy picture of an E. coli cell and this thin line here is the periplasm. It corresponds to roughly 5% of the cell volume. And as we have shown, and I'll show you some data, is that if you take a ruthenium-based metathesis cofactor and add a biotin to it, it will diffuse through the outer membrane. And if you have streptavidin in the periplasm, you can assemble your artificial metalloenzyme in the periplasm. Again, anything that has a molecular weight less than 600 that is either neutral or cationic will passively diffuse 
and therefore it's quite easy to bring in the substrate into the periplasm and perform catalysis. So here is our biotinylated metathesis catalyst. It's derived from the best homogeneous system, so the so-called hoveda grobs catalyst. We just added a biotin anchor on one of these aromatic moieties. Here's the substrate that we selected, which upon ring-closing metathesis leads to umbelliferone, which is fluorescent, which allows you to monitor the metathesis activity. So if you now perform ICP-MS, so essentially it's a way of determining how much ruthenium you have in a cell. If you have a cell that does not express any streptavidin and you add your cofactor, you incubate, you wash, you see some non-specific accumulation, roughly 10 ppbs of ruthenium. If you have cytoplasmic expression of streptavidin and localization of the protein, you see that there's a little bit more of ruthenium that accumulates, so roughly 15 ppb, suggesting that indeed the ruthenium can you know, permeate through the inner membrane leading to accumulation. But most gratifyingly, if you have streptavidin that is compartmentalized into the periplasm, you get significantly higher levels of ruthenium, suggesting that you know, it might be a good place to perform catalysis. And here's the the key experiment, so this is an, an E. coli pellet for a strain that does not express streptavidin. So you, you, know, you express, I mean, you, you grow the cells, spin down, resuspend, add the cofactor, incubate half an hour, spin down, wash, add substrates. You see essentially no fluorescence, whereas if you have streptavidin that is compartmentalized into the periplasm of E. coli, you add the cofactor, incubate, wash, add substrate. You see the immediate appearance of this blue fluorescence coming from the formation of umbelliferone. And again, we tried very hard and we're very pleased to see that this substrate is completely bioorthogonal, which means it does not get derivatized by any natural enzyme. So based on this finding, you can basically now apply directed evolution. That is, you start with wild-type streptavidin, you randomize using NNK codons in a 96 well-played format. Position 121, you see that there's a slight improvement going from the lysine to the arginine. You fix this position, you randomize 49, you randomize 119, et cetera. And by the time you reach the fifth generation, you feel, you know, we have improved it. We can indeed in the periplasm of E. coli improve the performance of an artificial metathesis catalyst, and therefore we're ready to test this on purified samples. So you, we selected two of the classical substrates which require HPLC analysis, and indeed you show that compared to the best homogeneous systems or to the free cofactor, you can indeed lead to significantly improved turnover numbers. So here we have 700 turnovers or 650. And for this reaction here, which is a more challenging substrate, you get roughly 100 turnovers or 90 turnovers. Again, this significantly outperforms the classical metathesis catalysts that are water soluble. Okay, so having found this, we decided what we need to do, and we knew that there were two positions in streptavidin that are critical meaning lying close to where the cofactor is found, and these positions are 112 and 121. So there's the PhD student, Tobias Vornholz, set out to essentially create the double saturation mutagenesis library consisting of mutations at position 121 and 112, and secreted this into the periplasm. And these are the expression levels that can be quantified by a fluorescent biotin titration. And what is most gratifying here is that you see that over 90% of these 400 mutants have more than 10 micromolar biotin, free biotin binding sites in the periplasm. So this is really quite pleasing. I mean, the expression level is really very good. The proteins fold very nicely, and you can be sure that you have you know, a, a reasonable number of free biotin binding sites to perform catalysis. So with this 400 double mutant library, we selected five different reactions, which are summarized here, and we essentially screened these 400 mutants in a 96 well-played format. And the only one that is metathesis is shown here. 
suggesting, so it's reaction one, that you can indeed identify double mutants that are significantly better than the wild type. And again, there's a few other reactions I don't want to go into. But so having done this in the periplasma of E. coli, you can then go on to screen purified samples. But as you can see, compared to the wild type, you have essentially out of this double mutant library, some double mutants that perform you know, five to eight times better than, than the wild type. And more importantly, the mutants you find in the periplasma of E. coli are nicely reproduced into purified samples of, of uh, streptavidin. Okay. But so this was a good starting point, but again, arguably, you know, the substrate that we used are, are not very useful for uh, in vivo catalysis. So what we set out to do is to identify a system that would allow us for selection. And the idea would, would be to take an E. coli oxytroph that, you know, has been deleted by one essential gene and then substitute or supplement this oxytroph with an artificial metalloenzyme that would allow E. coli to grow. And the substrate that we selected is indole, which is the last intermediate on the tryptophan biosynthesis. And most of you may know that tryptophan is the least abundant amino acid in E. coli, and therefore you don't need very high levels of indole for E. coli to live. So essentially, if you if you provide two micromolar of indole to E. coli that has the last enzyme, which is TRPB, that will convert this indole into tryptophan, this E. coli can grow. So here is a selection of reactions. Again, you recognize that I'm a chemist. So you can do a gold catalyzed hydroamination. You can do a dealination, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the substrate that you could use to do ring closing metathesis followed by hydrolysis to generate your indole. So these are the types of reactions that essentially you know, five graduate students are currently looking on. But I would like now to outline a perhaps more versatile strategy to develop a selection. But so, I mean, we're actively working on this, but I would like to show you an, another very versatile substrate that we're using either in a microfluidics platform or for the delivery of indole. And if you look at this substrate here, if you allow it to undergo ring closing metathesis, you will generate essentially a cyclohexadiene, which will spontaneously undergo 1,4 elimination to release the cargo, in this case, coumarine, and indole. And you could view this cargo as either being a fluorescent probe, but you could also release indole by ring closing metathesis. And we showed that this actually works either in the periplasm or streptavidin, which is surface displayed on E. coli. So this system here allows you, as a result of ring closing metathesis, to release essentially any probe. And I'd like to show you an illustration. So this is a, a title page that we prepared for, for JAX. But this is, this is our attempt to integrate such artificial metalloenzyme into what people call all DNA protocells. And this was a collaboration with Andreas Walter, and I will walk you through it. So what Andreas Walter had discovered was if you have essentially very long DNA strands, which consist of 20 A repeats, separated by what he called essentially a DNA barcode with this sequence here. So if you add 10 equivalents of this very long poly A strand with one equivalent of the complementary poly T, which also has a DNA barcode, and if you follow a very strict temperature program, the poly T will assemble with the poly A forming essentially double-stranded DNA. But since you have such a large excess of this poly A strand, essentially the inside of your protocell will be very viscous, loaded with your excess poly A. And more importantly, you will have this DNA barcode with the sequence shown here that is available to immobilize anything with the complementary DNA barcode to this red DNA. And so he reached out to me because I, I've known him for a few years saying, oh, why don't we try to bring in an artificial metalloenzyme 
within this all DNA protocell. And since streptavidin is a homotetrameric protein, we decided to sacrifice one of the biotin binding sites by adding a biotin which was equipped with the complementary DNA strands to this DNA here. And then we would add streptavidin, then we would add our biotinylated cofactor, and this would allow us to assemble an artificial metalloenzyme in an all DNA protocell. And so as many you know, cellular people do lots of fluorescent experiments, so you can show that the essentially the, the outer membrane of your protocell is indeed double-stranded, so you can have DNA intercalators, and then you can use fluorescently labeled streptavidin. You can add a biotinylated probe with a fluorescent uh, label, and then you can merge all of the cells, really showing that indeed you have what you claim to have, namely you have a streptavidin that is localized inside of your all DNA protocell, which has free biotin binding sites that would allow you to assemble your artificial metalloenzyme in the all DNA protocell. And then we use this profluorescent probe, which as a result of ring closing metathesis leads to the release of umbiliferone. And the student screens a number of streptavidin isoforms. So as you can see, wild type gives you some, a small signal in solution. And to our surprise, for all of these, you can see that the activity inside of the protocell is significantly higher than the activity of the free artificial metalloenzyme. And so we are honestly had no idea why this was the case. We're very pleased to see that some of them had you know, a 30-fold increase in, in activity upon incorporation. But trust me, the referee did not miss this point. And he said, you need to rationalize why this is so. And so what, what we were very pleased to see that we, you know, we tested various things, but essentially we hypothesized that it's the crowding in the DNA protocell that is responsible for the increased activity. So if you now perform catalysis in a very viscous PEG3000 solution, you can see that the free cofactor, whether you have it in water or in PEG, you see that it has the same activity. However, if you now take an artificial metalloenzyme, you see that the activity in the presence of PEG is significantly higher than the activity in aqueous solution, suggesting that this increased activity may possibly be traced back to the, vis the viscosity of the protocell, or if you like, the crowding, as biologists like to call it. So with this at hand, we started looking at you know, how does this reaction proceed? So you can mix all DNA protocells that are not equipped with the artificial metalloenzyme with protocells that have this ruthenium catalyst, and you can monitor the appearance of fluorescence as the product that is produced is fluorescent. And what came as a big surprise is that as the reaction proceeds, you can see that the metathesis active DNA protocells grow in size quite dramatically. And if you look at it down here, so the average protocell diameter is roughly two micrometers. And that that has an artificial metalloenzyme inside of it, you see that over 60 minutes, the, the diameter goes from two to 12. So again, the growth is quite pronounced and it's shown on this slide here. So this is after half an hour. These are the empty protocells, and these are the protocells that are equipped with the artificial metalloenzyme that leads to the release of umbiliferone, and you see the volume has dramatically increased. And what's, again, so this was quite unexpected, but what came as even more unexpected is that as the protocells grow, they will ultimately fuse. And the reason for this, and this took quite some experimentation, is that what happens is that the product of the reaction, which is this umbiliferone, is a very good DNA intercalator. And more importantly, it intercalates preferentially in AT rich regions, which is exactly what we have as the double stranded DNA outer membrane. So, this is kind of the end of this story here, which was based on 
artificial metalloenzymes relying on streptavidin. And I'd like to spend a few minutes on talking about human carbonic anhydrase as a host for artificial metalloenzyme. And so what we set out to do here was to try to engineer an enzyme cascade starting from essentially oleic acids, trying to make cyclic alkenes. So if you look at oleic acid, what you would require is one of these non-heme dependent decarboxylases that would convert this carboxylic acid into the corresponding alkene with release of CO2. And then you'd have a substrate with two olefins, which could then undergo ring closing metathesis to afford the corresponding cycloheptene and this terminal alkene that could potentially dimerize. Okay, so this was the plan, but again, cycloheptene may not be the most interesting substrate. So we then speculated that if we could convert this alkene into a carboxylic acid, then we could use two of these UNDB decarboxylases that would lead to a diolefinic substrate that could undergo ring closing metathesis to form cyclic alkenes of perhaps more interest in the, in the synthetic community. So the question is, how could you convert an alkene into a carboxylic acid? And the way we did this was essentially hydration, oxidation, the corresponding ketone, and the ketone, thanks to a bayer villiger monooxygenase, you could turn it into an ester, and the, the oxygen could be either inserted at this position or at this position. And then if you have it introduced at this position, you could go hydrolysis, and then ultimately oxidation, oxidation to the dicarboxylic acid with seven carbons between the two carboxylates. And if you take the bayer villiger monooxygenase that inserts an oxygen at this position, again, followed by hydrolysis, you directly get the dicarboxylic acid, but this time with eight methylene units. And by ring-closing metathesis, you could get either cyclopentene or cyclohexene. So again, we engineered this cascade, but the last step, which is essentially the conversion of the dicarboxylic acid to the diolefin and the metathesis had to be engineered in a second strain. So essentially we have a strain that has everything all the way to the UNDB. And then we have a second strain that undergoes the decarboxylations, plural and metathesis. And again, so for surface display purposes, it is best, at least in our hands, to select a monomeric protein. And the protein that we selected is carbonic anhydrase, which is a protein, a monomeric protein, molecular weight 30,000, which contains a zinc three histidines in its active site. And as many of you may know, it's responsible for essentially hydrating car um, uh, carbon dioxide to bicarbonate. And this there are many, many very high affinity inhibitors that mimic the intermediate here, and these are sulfonamides. So if you consider this aryl sulfonamide as the anchor, then you would bring in your cofactor and bind it to this aromatic moiety. And again, what we did is we took this so-called Hoveda Grubbs catalyst and we equipped it with this aryl sulfonamide, allowing us to essentially express streptavidin on the outer membrane, uh, express carbonic anhydrase on the outer membrane of E. coli, add the cofactor and screen for improved mutants for ring-closing metathesis. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's directed evolution. So you start with wild-type carbonic anhydrase, you screen libraries, you identify, you quantify the product formation by uh, GC. And after, you know, a triple mutants, you get you know, 3.5-fold increase versus wild type, and you're ready to go. So essentially, this comes down to the fact that, as I mentioned, you have one E. coli strain that brings you all the way to the dicarboxylic acid, and then your second strain converts your dicarboxylic acid into the diolefin, which is, is a membrane-bound enzyme, and finally, your carbonic anhydrase expressed on the surface of E. coli converts this diolefin into the corresponding cyclic olefins, either cyclohexene or cyclopentene. So now I have 
five more minutes to uh, outline a, a much more recent project that we've been carrying out with uh, David Baker based on a de novo protein scaffold for ring closing metathesis purposes. So what I would like to show here is that I, you know, I was approached by David Baker and uh, he suggested that uh, we should design essentially a, a small molecule metathesis catalyst and he would design around this cofactor a tight binding protein based on the so-called tandem repeat proteins shown here. And with this at hand, he essentially designed 23 histag TRP tandem repeat proteins, which we expressed in E. coli. These are highly stable. It's really it ticks all the boxes that we like, highly soluble. And you can essentially lyse the E. coli cell, heat shock them, and you have 90% purity of your TRP. Here's the TRP. And we selected this TRP number 18 out of the 23, which had reasonably good affinity for the cofactor and proved to be quite active. But unfortunately, the, the affinity was not quite high enough or low enough for the dissociation constant. And we therefore set out to engineer a more hydrophobic active site with the introduction of a tryptophan at position 116. And we're very pleased to see that we're now, you know, sub-micromolar dissociation constants, which is really what we were after. And then with this, we selected this substrate here that you've seen before in the presence of the cofactor, cell-free lysates. At pH 4, you can release your umbiliferone as, long as, as well as ethylene and the naphthalene side product. The free cofactor is moderately active. Incorporation with wild-type TRP18, you have essentially twice the activity. You introduce this highly hydrophobic residue. It should be the wild type as a phenylalanine, actually. I apologize for this. And here you see improved activity, and then you do you randomize position Q5. Sorry for the noise, should soon be over. And then you fix this position Q5, and you randomize position 179, and you go basically from 20 turnovers to 82 using cell lysates for screening. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. In the past 20 years, we've been surfing at the interface between homogeneous and enzymatic catalysis. We have access to both enantiomers. We typically work under aqueous solutions, but we've also worked in, in mixtures of organic up to 50% DMSO, for example. Substrate specificity is typically quite large, which is reminiscent of homogeneous catalysis. But if required, we can narrow it down. We like to combine chemical with genetic optimization strategies. We have shown repeatedly that the cofactor activity or lifetime is significantly improved upon incorporation of the protein environment. And my focus current is really on bringing this in a cellular environment. And you know, the artificial metalloenzyme are significantly more essentially compatible with, with cellular um, environments than the, the free cofactors. I would like to thank the co-workers you know, that have contributed this research here. So we, I briefly talked about the halo tag, this carbonic anhydrase for this enzyme cascade. Streptavidin remains the largest effort in the group. And the TRP in collaboration with David Baker has been carried out by Robin Zhu and Boris Lotchkin. Here are some of the collaborators. I thank the, the funding. And here's a picture, a recent picture of the group on a group trip. And, and roughly the group is, I would say, one third biologists and two thirds chemists. And I, I really enjoy, you know, working outside of my comfort zone. So, you know, I, I, I come up with following a discussion with, with the coworkers with an idea and the biologists are really in charge of bringing this crazy idea into something that is actually realistic. So this is the end of my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions. I will stop sharing and thank you for attending. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a really inspiring talk. There is a lot of questions in chat. Can you see chat? I can see the chat. If you could read a question before answering it, that's going to help for the recording. Do I have to read this? So this or I can is, read it. I, no, I'm, I'm just kidding you. Chemists 
all the way. So that's me. I agree building artificial biological system is a matter of engineering chemistry. Biology had a go already. Let chemists do the work now. Yes, I agree. And again, I, I think this, this claim by Gerald Joyce that biology is nothing more than chemistry with the memory is, is very insightful and has been uh, you know, very inspiring for me. Did you ever try a similar artificial metal enzyme in bacterial micro compartments or many cells or any other artificially uh, bacteria compartment instead of natural bio? So we have had some go at it in collaboration with a few people, but um, so what should I say? So yeah, we had a colleague in the department that was big at polymerosomes and these polymerosomes can actually be introduced in mammalian cells, which we've done as well as in bacteria. So we have looked at this, but without much, you know, didn't quite see the, the advantage. So we had great ideas that we could not really realize. So this is really interesting. Thank you very much. Do you know if those enzymes would work in cell-free environments expressed in vitro? And the answer to this is yes. Because in collaboration with Sven Ponke, we have done this. So we've done uh, essentially droplet screening using uh, in, uh, in vitro uh, translation transcription. So yes, it does work. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mention the names of the people who asked the questions. I apologize. So the first question came from Brian Heichel. The second one with these micro compartments came from Knut Avert. Uh, Brenton said the cell-free environment, and now comes the next one, which comes from Anna Marie Bennett. I have one general question. This is a fascinating topic, a whole new frontier in synthetic biology. Thank you very much. I'm honored. What kinds of metals could we consider using artificial metal enzymes that are completely not utilized in natural biology? I don't know if there's a big fire going on, but it seems to be quite loud here. I apologize. Uh, we actually don't hear anything. Um, oh, from... that's that's the power of Zoom. It will remove anything that it yes. does not consider as. That's good. But there are sirens everywhere. Could you speculate what kind of chemistry this could enable that is not possible now? So, Anna Marie, this is basically my business model. Let's look at reactions that nature cannot do and see if we can do them. And I must confess, when I, so when I, I moved to Basel, I approached many biologists asking them, if you were given a reaction that nature does not have, which reaction should it be? And I must confess, I have immense admiration for biologists, but this is not a question that many of them could answer because, I mean, you have learned what biology can do and you were not taught, or very few of you have been taught what chemists can do that biology can't. So essentially, this metathesis is a very nice example of a reaction that biology cannot do, but has immense potential if you combine it with natural enzymes. So I've shown you one example, but we have many others that we would love to look at. Okay, so again, I you know I'm I'm happy to give you a list, but so you know, creating carbon-carbon bonds. Palladium catalyzed, this is you know called cross-coupling. Nature does not do it this way. Nature has other ways of doing it. It's just, it's nice to think that you have ways that nature does not have. And you know, let, let's take an example. Famous is the, you know, the, the yeast synthesis of artemisinine. Unfortunately, despite the beauty of the system, the last step could not be performed in yeast, right? So you form artemisinic acids, but then you have to isolate this and you have to do it outside of yeast. And I would like to think that if you could do this last step also in yeast would be nice. You know, so this is the type of thing that we're, we're thinking of. But you, should, you guys should stop with questions, damn it. The thing is, the screen is moving and I'm losing track. But so here's the next one. Eva Samuel, could any of these enzymes you talked about be used in cyanobacteria? Yes, I'm sure it could. Essentially, this is too far outside of my comfort zone. So if anybody would like to try it, send me an email. I, you know, 
many of the, the things I've talked about were collaborations and arguably cyanobacteria are really very interesting systems. So uh, Stefan Durkel, all of those enzymes optimized to work at bacterial physiological pH. Answer is no. Could you see any benefits that would work at higher, lower pH? So I must confess that, for example, metathesis likes to work at low pH. So typically pH 6 is good, pH 5 is better. And I was very pleased to see that E. coli does not mind low pH. So you can go to pH 5 and E. coli is happy. I am told that pH 8 is not good for bacteria. Most of what we do is either neutral or acidic pH. Again, if there was a reason to go at higher pH, I'm pretty sure we could find a strain that would, you know, would enable this. So Tanner Müller, do most of the enzyme design you do is rational design or selection from random sequence libraries. So, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we recently moved to microfluidics is that we would like to increase the throughput. So for the time being, we have looked at mutations close to the active sites. So th this is, I mean, because you cannot screen 10,000 mutants, but we recently published a paper in Angevante, I think it was earlier this year or maybe last year, where we do droplets and this allows us to massively increase the throughput and this would allow us to, to move further away. So one thing I should confess is streptavidin is not an enzyme by default, it's a binding protein, right? It binds to, and as a consequence, it's not a very flexible protein, which means if you look at the dynamics, it's very limited dynamics, which means mutations very far from the active site do not lead to a major structural reorganization of the protein. And this is why our attempts to introduce mutations further away from you know, the, the active site have not been very successful. But again, so they are, I would say, seven, seven positions that you can randomize that are close by. So this keeps you busy already, but it would be nice to have a more malleable protein scaffold where distant mutations would have a larger effect. And so, yes, random sequence, we, we are moving towards this thanks to microfluidics. So Tai Seok Moon, uh, I was wondering whether you could share your insights regarding directed evolution versus prediction-based enzyme design. So again, you know, I decided today to talk only about metathesis, but so we have been actively collaborating with the machine learning teams. And I mean, this, I must say, I'm very impressed. So I was extremely skeptical and some of the results that they have generated have really blown me away. So things that many of those, you know, you see, you know, if, if you in your training set, you have a leucine and your machine learning say, why don't you try isoleucine? You're tempted to say, no kidding, right? You have not taught me much. But I mean, some of the mutations that I suggested, including some cysteine mutations for a gold enzyme have really convinced me that this is more than just intuition. I mean, there, there is something to machine learning. So again, prediction-based, you know, predict, I mean, machine learning is not prediction, but so, you know, arguably, you know, once you have identified mutants, you can, you know, you can rationalize and then design the next step. But uh, I think there is great potential for machine learning. But unfortunately, this is a very busy field and I'm not sure I want to go there, you know, on my own. Did Alpha Fold help you? So this is from Patrick Ferrero from, I believe you're the one from Tokyo. Uh, help you or for metal enzyme, the existing structure AlphaFold doesn't really work well. So no, I must say that AlphaFold again, machine learning is spectacular. Even the, you know, yeah, so it, it works very nicely, yes. But I mean, for most of the stuff we do, we have an X-ray structure of the starting scaffold. So it's not very necessary. But so again, to, to make a long story short, I'm very pleased to see that the field of artificial metal enzyme is picking up and it's a matter of, you know, finding a good scaffold, playing around with it and with the power of directed evolution, if you have a cofactor that is water compatible, you can get 
a long way with this strategy. And again, so, you know, my, I'm perhaps one of the very few people that is really trying to bring this in a cellular environment. You can, you can use this for, you know, synthetic methodology, but I really would like to do in vivo enzyme cascades. This is really what I would like to achieve. Um, so I, I have a follow-up question. I don't know if this is something you're looking at, but a lot of people seem to be enamored recently with scaffolding of enzymes and talking about substrate handoff and how you, you can get much better specificity and more complexity in the product. Is that something you're looking at with artificial metallo enzymes too, or, or that's not really something yeah. that we need right now? I mean, considering that you come from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, whatever artificial organelle background, so what we have done, not published, is that we have put a natural enzyme and an artificial metallo enzyme into a polymerosome, and we indeed see massively increased activity. That, I mean, yeah. So that we have seen scaffolding. We had an attempt. We're using spy tag, spy catch to bring enzymes together, but there we were not very convinced. And so, I mean, it, so essentially, if you look at the the tryptophan biosynthesis, the last two steps are indeed there's a channel that brings the indole and the TRPB that will ultimately lead to the tryptophan. And so, you know, we have we have thought about, you know, bringing in this TRPB in the proximity, but for the time being, we don't need it. So basically two micromolar of tryptophan suffices to allow E. coli to grow. So if we need it, we could do it, but we've not looked into this. But the compartmentalization in a polymerosome is quite beneficial, at least in, in one in one case. Thank you. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we're out of time right now, so I will wrap up saying thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, everyone else, for a great discussion. Thank you. And have a great rest of your day, rest of your evening. Thank you. And yeah. bye. bye, -bye. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you very much. Bye. bye.